And I was like, why are you so obsessed with me? I was like, why are you so obsessed with me? Now, before I start into my commentary reviewing Tasha Kay's interview, I think I should take you all back down memory lane. Because I just find it so interesting, the narratives that are still into play today that have been into play since last year. And it's strange that, as I told you all, from the moment of me making my opinion known to you all, I became a target. But it's only one of many times I've become that target. And it's cool because people don't want to answer the questions that are on my mind. And this specific moment is why I need to bring this back to your attention. As you all can think back, I've always invited you all to check out my website. The link has always been in the description long before Patreon because I've been setting these things up for reference points for moments like this. Because if we think back, let's, let's talk about it. The twins were on Tasha K, right? Tasha K slick trying to clean up her, old, her whole little image. Mind you, I first got my first strike on my channel coming at Tasha K because I just found it quite interesting the information she was putting out, especially when it comes to Homeland Security allegedly investigating R. Kelly. Nonetheless, it's been a lot of things said on these platforms that are very questionable. And when I ask these questions, how can this person be a mole if they weren't around or ask questions as to why wasn't this done or why was this done? No answers. All you see is distractions. But let's remind you, think back. According to the twins that were on Tasha K's platform, they brought in a specific blogger, Dana J. Her and Kip. Now, in the beginning, it was unclear to me as to how it all went down. But according to what I've been told, a person by the name of Rocky Bivens was reached out to by the twins. He put the twins in contact with Kip and Kip verified that he knew Dana J. At that particular point, I don't know if Dana J was online going at people like Tim Savage. I'm unclear with that part. But I know that he caught their attention for whatever reason. So when people kept throwing around, he's a mole. And the twins will clearly tell you that he wasn't around. And it clearly debunked some of the things that have been said pertaining to this defense fund that people keep bringing up. The fact that it's still an issue is interesting to me. Even this. I pointed out everything that was brought my way pertaining to Dana J, including his strange connections to alleged victims, alleged people from the first sex tape, all these things that these people said he admitted to. Nonetheless, from what I saw, the things that they said still didn't make any sense. According to them, Dana J is quite the liar. So I'm still trying to understand why if he's quite the liar to them, they're always going over and beyond trying to prove certain things he says to be true, even though we know it's false. Especially when it comes to this baby with Rashona Landfair. When it comes to the defense fund, you had the twins posting that before Douglas Anton took over the defense fund, it was verified. <laughs> and I was like, why are you so obsessed with me? Then all of a sudden, shit started hitting the fan. People who were once clicked up started to fall out. People scams started to fall apart. People started to come out saying these crazy things on these public platforms, confirming their affiliations. You got people 
coming out saying they support people that are in these indictments and then deleting those videos. It was a whole lot of crazy things happening. But we cannot forget, as I'm pointing out yet again, it all started through the twins reaching out to Rocky to get in contact with Kip to verify Dana. At some point, they fell out with Dana. From what I saw, it could have been a lot of people passing these messages with their own agendas as they tend to do. I've gotten quite a lot of messages. I've been pulled into a lot of situations that had absolutely nothing to do with me. So I am perfectly aware of how this fallout could have gone down. But what made me side eye the twins was for them to come out and publicly say the FBI told them to block Dana J. Then you had all this fueling the people who don't like him running with these narratives but at the end of the day let's hypothetically say they were talking to the FBI why would the FBI tell them to block an individual that they brought into the mix what's really going on nobody answered that question these girls they say he brought around R. Kelly they can't even tell you if it was 95 or 96 so how can they place him there? The fact that I have messages in which the twins are at the center of being said that they're working on being a power of attorney. The same twins came at me when I had questions about a certain A&R, Julius. The twins have been in the center of a lot of miscommunication and it's a shrug of the shoulders and they're bad but again this goes back to what I said last year as to why didn't this man have people professional people handling his affairs maybe what we're seeing is clearly the problem all these people wanting these titles all these people bringing in outsiders for what now let's go into this interview as to what the twins said because again they were around between 99 and 2007 but it's funny one of them made sure to go back to their profile to note they were no longer working for him since 2002 even though there's articles saying that they unofficially began to do social media work for him for free in 2016. Hmm. Funny, I didn't see anything too positive or anything to change his image in between 2016 and the savages coming out with their cult allegations. But whatever, let's just give them credit. They were helping to reinvent R. Kelly's image. So let's just see what they had to say. And periodically I may interject with something. I specifically cannot take Tasha K with her victims, 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 bullcrap. When again, where are the victims? If everybody they have brought forth to us, every person that has publicly made their statement has been deemed not credible, you're going to have to show us some victims for us to keep running and listening to you say the word victims when you should be saying alleged or at least accusers. But anyways, let's roll the footage. So as I proceeded with this video, I came to the conclusion I'm not going to commentate on all of it because a lot of it is going to get on my nerves. I'm just going to point out a couple things that caught my attention and the first thing that caught a lot of people's attention was the fact that Tasha Kay's energy for the twins was completely different than what she expressed when Jaguar Wright was on her platform 
people were so offended saying that she basically was trying to discredit Jaguar Wright. Meanwhile, she's giving these white women this open ear and dialogue. But we're going to just act like she hadn't spent the last few years putting out all this slanderous information, boasting about being the first one to break this R. Kelly story before surviving R. Kelly and all the things she said in between then. So I don't understand why people would assume she would just attack these women in the way that she came at Jaguar Wright when she pretty much did one and the same thing. With Jaguar Wright, she wanted to discredit her. With these women, she's trying to make it appear that she's somewhat unbiased after all she's done, after all the things she's participated in slandering this man, potentially tainting his potential jurors, all the things she said, not knowing whether it's true or not, trying to give these exclusives that have led to this man's arrest. But anyways, fair use, just so you all know, this is not an attempt to copy or take credit for Tasha Kibi's work. It's just to point out some clear educational factors. Very uh, tough time frame. And so um, I believe you ladies, I don't want to speak for you, have been advocate, advocates. You wanted uh, your calling for his release. Um, you feel that he is innocent. And I just kind of wanted to, to unwind your story. Because you didn't get much time in the Surviving R. Kelly, a documentary done by R. Kelly. I mean, done by right. my time. Okay, on R. Kelly. Right. Okay. On R. Kelly. Right. Yes, on R. Kelly. And so um, uh, I've always wanted to hear more from you, okay? Because I, I, I kind of thought you were coming from a non-biased position, you know? And so, so what were all the people giving you your exclusives coming from? Oh, you already know their motivations and you didn't care the consequences but anyway we'll humor you so um i'm happy to have you here i'm glad i caught you ladies because i know that you are very very busy right now <laughs> uh, with kids and work and things like that and so uh jen we can start with you if you could just tell the audience who you are before we dive into um some details that have not been out yet okay yeah. uh you know giving your time uh working or R. Kelly. So, yeah, we can start with you, Jim. You can introduce yourself and Lizzie will Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Jen Perryman Emrick, and um, I was an intern for R. Kelly um, starting in 1999. I interned at the, I interned at the studio um, after Lindsay got hired. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be in the music industry, and Rob gave me an opportunity um, as an intern to see if it was something that would be for me. Okay. And um, and then eventually I became one of his personal assistants. And then I did not see the, the longevity in that as a career. Um, mainly because, and I'll just be honest, mainly because his wife at the time was very difficult to deal with. We're talking and about she would, uh -huh. okay. yeah. So that's, that's ultimately why I quit. Um, but Rob was uh, always wonderful. He was very professional, a great boss, and um, and also a, became a good friend. And so um, because we'd always worked so well together and just got along, we um, continued our friendship over the years. And first we stayed in contact because Lindsay worked with him for so long. And then uh, eventually I moved out to Las Vegas and um, every time Rob would come in town to do a show or for the Billboard Music Awards, he would always make sure that we would meet up, um, have dinner, go out to clubs. And, um, and then um, as of up until he got arrested, we'd always just stayed in contact over the phone. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Lindsay, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Lindsay. 
Yeah, I'm Lindsay Perryman Dunn. Um, I started working with R. Kelly in 1999 um, after I graduated from uh, audio recording school um, in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, we're from Chicago, so it was natural for me to come back from my program in Tempe, Arizona and do an internship. At the time, Chicago had Chicago Recording Company and Chicago Tracks. Those were the two places for audio recording engineers to intern and then get hired. Um, CRC, which is Chicago Recording Company, they had a reputation for not hiring their interns, okay. where Ch the Chicago Tracks had um, a better history. So mm -hmm. that's the entire reason why I ended up at Chicago Tracks. Okay. Um, I began as an intern and, um, you know, getting coffee, cleaning, you know, studios, food runs, things like that. Um, and then I got the phone gig that was like a big promotion for me. So I'd be answering the phones at Chicago Tracks during the day. So you all recall that in Surviving R. Kelly, you had people making reference to these runners. Again, making it seem criminal in the things that were being done. Painting the narrative of how R. Kelly is such this master manipulator, such this evil person. But you'll come to find in researching him, majority of the people working for him weren't official employees. A lot of these people were referred through other people. And the biggest point of all is for a person to be such a master manipulator, so controlling, I find that hard to swallow when this man wasn't even in control of his own finances. For this person to be the top person in this Rico enterprise, he doesn't even have control of his own money. He's getting stipends, as the twins will later point out. That doesn't sound like the head boss, does it? and then intern on a, um, as an assistant audio engineer at night um, in music one. Um, so I did that for, uh, I guess it was, I want to say, because it was like the summer. So I guess it was through about January. And Robert had been in Philadelphia uh, recording some artists on the East Coast, so he hadn't been in the studio a whole lot, just a little bit, and um, he called me one day because Lafayette, um, his music director at the time, uh, thought that I would be a great addition to the Art Kelly team uh, in a studio management aspect for Robert's studios that he had at Tracks. He had music too, and then um, an office downstairs and another small studio. So he called me from Philadelphia and said, Lindsay, I want you to come work for me. I said, okay, and so we'll start now. So I did. I went back and Lafayette set me up in an office. And so I moved up. Um, I worked with him on and off for about eight years. I ended as a, my role was general manager. It was the last position I had with him. Okay. Um, and I went and worked with other artists um, in the interim. So I did Rock Him, Nelly, Cash Money. Uh, B2K, I worked with A. Marie, uh, I worked at Jive Records for a couple of years, and then at each time, whenever I was done with the gig, I might come back to the R. Kelly <laughs> team, and so back and forth, I'd go from Chicago to L.A., back to Chicago to L.A., New York, I lived in New York for a couple of years, and um, then I left, uh, my job, I left with him, it was like 2007, 2008, right at the time of the trial, and mainly because he wasn't reporting very much. He was trying to report, but he wasn't getting a lot done. He was very stressed, and Chicago Recording Company actually called and offered me a position as their executive producer. So I... Another situation and more opportunities coming their way in being associated with R. Kelly. But the major point in there is she said she was working for R. Kelly up until 2007, 2008, when she testified at the first trial. And this was the first thing that made me side-eye them was the first time I recall seeing these women 
they kind of fudged what Lindsay's testimony was. And I have pointed it out to you all exactly what she said. My thing is, if you were going to come out and give interviews, just keep it 100. So the fact that they sugarcoated what her original testimony was just made me look at them sideways. That was the first time. But again, gave them the benefit of the doubt. There would be many more times in which they would do things, as I mentioned earlier in the video, that would put them in the middle of a lot of back and forth and a lot of confusion. But the major point that I'm going to get to next is about his finances. You have them, or you have Lindsay being the woman who pointed out R. Kelly as being the man in the tape, Rashona being the woman in the tape. The girl, rather, the way they put it. But according to them, they never saw anything. They don't recognize any of these women who sued R. Kelly or reached settlements with R. Kelly. They didn't recognize any of the women from the docuseries. This is their position at this particular point. Just keep that in mind. Now, Lindsay goes on to say how she was manipulated into her testimony. And then, considering what she's saying now and what she said then, it just seems a little odd. She tells us now the things she's never seen. She's never seen R. Kelly being inappropriate, never saw Rashona along with R. Kelly. So, I don't understand how logically somebody can trick you or manipulate you into saying that you agree that it's R. Kelly and this girl on this tape. But this is one of those situations to where we never know what the prosecutor said. We never know what threats they made. For all we know, they could have went in there and said, we saw you on a tape doing this, this, and that. Who really knows? But at the end of the day, this is another situation to where if a man is so controlling, he's such a manipulator, this, this, is net, he's still going to be open with a person who could have potentially cost him 15 years behind bars with her testimony. He'll forgive this person and give this person another opportunity to be around them, whether it's one year, two years later, whatever the case may be. They end up talking again. This is a person, they say, who likes to indulge with children, who's going to bring back a person who has testified against them, knowing that they allegedly still likes to pursue children. Does that make any sense to you all? But let's go on to what her sister says, because this is something new that I've never heard anybody say say, you know, as a witness of that time with Lindsay, um, when I, I remember back in 1999, um, as an intern, um, for Rob, I was, uh, just coming into the studio, my daily shift, and one of the security approached me and he said, hey, has anybody from Sparkles Camp, which was an artist that Rob had dropped from his label, he said, has anyone from Sparkles Camp contacted you? And or been in contact with you in any way? And I said, no. I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard anything. And I said, why? What's going on? And he said, well, um, they're trying to get Rob to pay him or to pay her two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or they're going to take some tape to the press, not to the police, but to the press. And I said, oh, wow. I'm like, and I said, no. I, you know, I haven't heard anything. And so. That wouldn't have been useful information back then that according to Jen, somebody, one of the bodyguards was asking her about Sparkle and her alleged participation in this tape scandal. That's very interesting. Hmm. 
So the last thing I want to bring to your attention is the fact that, as I've mentioned before, Daryl McDavid stops working for R. Kelly in around 2013-2014. We know this is a time period in which R. Kelly is facing financial difficulties. The IRS has come at him. Drea coming with the child support. A lot of different things was heading his way. Now, mind you, it hadn't been too long of him recovering from an emergency throat operation. So with that being said, keep in mind all the narratives Tasha K has put out there. All these people she has implicated as being enablers. Now she's interested in their unbiased opinion. Keep this in mind. This man, according to Tasha Kibi, is such a control freak. He's done all these terrible things, but according to her, she has records to show that the alleged girl from the tape, Rashona Lanfair, was putting money on R. Kelly's book. Does that make sense to you? So the last thing to point out was the fact that R. Kelly, again, wasn't in control of his money. Therefore, he was not in control of any of these alleged settlements that took place. Daryl McDavid was. When R. Kelly starts asking questions about his finances, then a new strategy comes into play. As I believe, as I have tried to show you all throughout all this time, these people have used this tape and this fake alleged marriage as leverage over R. Kelly's head, in my opinion. You know, I've never heard this. No, I don't mean to cut you off, but what about his brother? No, Bruce and Carrie. Yeah. Well, Bruce was around when I was at the studio. I remember he brought, he had a little girl um, that he brought with him to the studio. So there's another family, you know, event at the studio. Um, but he was always in and out of jail. When he was out of jail, Robert always, you know, hired him for, like, security just to, you know, be there around him. Um, I never met Carrie, but from what I heard, and I don't know this for a fact, but he was a foster dad. So, when they were looking at him as being a possible contender for being the man in that tape in the 2008 trial, he was a foster dad, and that would have taken away his whole foster, you know, um, setup that he had with the state. And, and my understanding is he's helped he a lot of kids, but he's also he, he claims that R. Kelly, you know, his brother offered him fifty thousand dollars to take the rap for that team, and that he's um, actually seen other teams with his brother I, with other. I'm friends. willing to bet. Well, and like I said, Carrie was never around. Okay. So they didn't have a, a relationship, you know, and then Bruce, you hear good things, you know. I mean, you heard the jokes that, like, Rob played on his brother, but, you know, they played jokes on each other. But Carrie was not around. So I personally wouldn't trust anything he said hmm. because there's a reason why he wasn't around. Okay. You know, I mean, if he was his great loving brother, I would have met him at some point. I didn't. Yeah, I'm going to be talking to my brothers here, so, uh, And I've never heard anything bad about Perry, okay. you know, or Bruce, just that they run into trouble. That's the only thing I've ever heard. Um, I'm willing to bet, though, that if you talk to Carrie and he mentions my brother was going to pay me this for saying that it was me in the tape, um, it probably wasn't his brother that said that. It was probably someone like Daryl McDavid or an attorney that was trying to do that. And probably just trying to get rid of the whole scenario. Rob didn't even have access to his own money. No, he did. Daryl McDavid. I mean, there were there were times that Lindsay had to go pick up Rob off the freeway. Uh, freeway. Or the well, one time he yeah, one time he ran out of gas. He was going to his house in Olympia Fields. He was in his like McLaren, and he ran out of gas. So we had to get gas money to him. He was out at like 89th Street. You know. Okay. Um, then there was another scenario where he was at a hotel and I had to go pick him up because he couldn't, he didn't have money, you know, not that he, he wasn't broke, but he didn't have an ATM card. And 
Um, you know, he would get Daryl McDavid would cut a check, and either me or Jim Brown would go cash it. We'd give Rob his money whenever he needed it, cash. So he didn't operate on credit cards, and he was given a you know stipend, um, and then he would you know just go. Daryl McDavid. I mean, he just he was in charge of all of his money. They would review his books. I think every few months, but you know, honestly, I don't think Robert had the true education to understand, you know, everything, and he had to put a lot of trust into Daryl. And you know, Daryl was the accountant when he was manager. So, so I'm going to end this video on that note because, as I pointed out last year, I never saw where R. Kelly accused his brother. But I was willing to bet that it was some outside force putting these thoughts into his brother's head. The same outside forces that always implant these negative stories with people who have issues with R. Kelly. Who have issues with payments. Even though some of these outside voices are responsible for paying these people. Yet they want to give them a bad taste in their mouth about R. Kelly. This is the same thing that we see displayed on these YouTube streets. The envy, the jealousy, the back and forth, the planted narratives about this person and that person. When at the end of the day, I've said it always, let people reveal who they are and trust and believe the person they show you. Because at the end of the day, the truth is coming out. And I just, like I said, find it hard to believe this man is such a master manipulator. He has no control over his funds. He keeps allowing these people who have burned him back into his life. He has all these people that are supposed to be facilitating these jobs, but clearly aren't doing that. And they're going to be the first ones complaining about not getting paid, even though we can see evidence of these people making side deals behind the back of R. Kelly, pocketing money behind the back of R. Kelly. The root to all evil is the love of money, as they say. Just remember that as we continue to see what's going on with this case against R. Kelly. In conclusion, all these people that we have publicly seen speaking on behalf of R. Kelly have stated the same things, that they didn't know majority of these women from surviving R. Kelly. Yet people want to sit here and say that, well, there still has to be other victims because where there's smoke, there's fire. Not necessarily. If people are out here planting smoke bombs, there's no fire with that, is it? You have people like Kip who have said there's only a select group of people that he recognized when he was questioned by the FBI. You have the twins saying there's a select group of people that they recognize. Yet, the general public is giving weight to these actors that were put onto Lifetime's platform to tarnish R. Kelly's brand. Is that right? Make sure you go and check out my Patreon where the previous upload will give a little more context to this video about Rocky Bivens and the person he claims greatly inspired him and taught him the ins and outs of the business. The link will be in the description. Have a good day.